Hello and welcome to the July 2020 SBM at the Bedside. My name is Stephen Russell. I am from the University of Alabama in Birmingham at UAB and we're glad you're with us today. We um, are excited to have a good lineup of presenters today, which we will be, um, we will be hearing from here shortly. I'd like to um, make a special thank you to our presenters who um, will be coming up and we'll, we'll see them on the next slide. We'd like to acknowledge our uh, founding and institutional members from uh, Johns Hopkins Medicine, Stanford Medicine, and UAB Medicine, who are institutional founding members of the Society of Bedside Medicine. And many other members that you can see here as well are institutional members from Wake Forest, Lahaney Royal College of Physicians, um, and Texas Tech, as well as the University of Edinburgh. Uh, it's exciting to have this third month of live webinars where we will be speaking about unique issues that have uh, come before us during the age of COVID-19. The Society of Bedside Medicine is interested in exploring and understanding best practices of physician and patient interactions and understanding new knowledge of clinical skills during COVID-19. By participating in this webinar, you'll be able to receive CME credit and we'd like to um, draw your attention to this particular slide, which will be shared with our viewers after the um, webinar as well, where you can uh, find out more information about receiving CME credit. And today we're gonna be hearing uh, from multiple different voices from uh, across the United States. We'll be starting off with John Kugler from Stanford University, who'll be talking to us about practical pearls in terms of cleaning POCUS equipment. We'll also be hearing from Dr. Joshua Morgenstein, who'll be talking to us about some of the mental health challenges that have presented themselves during COVID-19. We have the great opportunity for Dr. Junaid Zaman, who's joining us from London, who'll be talking about COVID-19 and the cardiology consultant. And we'll also be hearing from Dr. Fernanda Rossi from uh, Palo Alto VA, who will be talking to us about COVID-19 and intimate partner violence. And finally, we'll be doing our second month of the Hidden and Here during COVID-19 segment, where Dr. Mega Shankara will be talking to us about uh, a, set, a spot that she wrote called Witness, which will be uh, exploring some ideas of um, Hidden and Here during COVID-19, and I'm looking forward to hearing from her about that. And then um, Sonu Fidani will be helping us with our closing and sharing more information. As before, we really want to explore issues of COVID-19 at the bedside. Each of us are speaking from the Society of Bedside Medicine or unique issues there. And we'd like to entertain questions that may come up related to that. If there are other questions that seem to be outside the scope of this focus today, while we would be interested in sharing information with you about that, we would like to reserve our questions and answers today based on the topics that we will be exploring. And so without further delay, I'd like to go ahead and have John Kugler from Stanford University share with us information about uh, the unique aspects of this and cleaning POCUS equipment during COVID-19. John? Hey everyone, um, my name is uh, Dr. John, John Kugler. I'm a hospitalist here at Stanford and I direct our uh, point of care ultrasound education program here. And uh, what we're gonna talk about today is how to use POCUS safely in the era of COVID-19. Uh, many of us think that using POCUS is gonna really help you and your patients to uh, get a better understanding of how their disease is going, but also hopefully to help your hospital reduce the amount of PPE being used because we think that we'll be able to use POCUS um, in lieu of things like additional chest x-rays where you have to have a second provider going in and putting on all this PPE, whereas you as the provider can get into the room, use point of care ultrasound and get out. As we started thinking about how to do this, we ran into the problem of moving equipment in and out of a contaminated room and thinking about how are we gonna do this safely um, without contaminating ourselves or other people on the unit or taking a contaminated ultrasound machine and bringing it in and potentially contaminating another patient. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna take you through actually a live demo here on how we've actually decided here at Stanford based on recommendations um, that we've received from the outside, specifically the, the Canadian Ultrasound Society um, published some uh, guidelines about how to do this safely and effectively. So as many of you, have, I'm sure, have already experienced, before you go into a COVID room, you really want to make sure that you have all the necessary equipment uh, for you. And I'm going to walk you through this demo. So first, we're going to start with the ultrasound machine, because that's really what the main thing that we want to talk about today. I would say that for most of you, if you've got access to it, the easiest thing to do is to take a pocket-sized machine. 
And so I'm gonna acknowledge my, my uh, wife and camera person, Dr. Brooke Cotter, who's, who's doing this, uh, who's kind enough to shoot video for us. I'm gonna show you two different pocket machines that we can bring in and use. Um, I've been using this particular machine uh, more because I can just pair it with a phone. Um, and so it's, uh, it's just one less thing to, to worry about. Um, rather than when I use this one, I use a tablet size, which is just a little bit bulkier. But both of them work well, all right? If you're gonna use a card-based machine like this here, Sonosite, um, this is actually a little bit more difficult. Um, the recommendation is if you're gonna use a card machine, the best thing to do is to leave the machine in, in the room with the patient. This is a little bit more feasible for things like ICU settings or some emergency room settings um, where the, the machine would just stay in there. For many of us, including myself, uh, I certainly don't have enough card-based machines where I could just leave one in the patient room. If you do want to take a card machine in and out, um, you would need to find a cover for the entire cart, um, which is actually not that easy to come by at some institutions. Um, at our institution, I don't have regularly access to, to one of those, and so we've been really sticking with the pocket size machines. So I'm going to gather all my equipment. I'm going to quickly go through all the things that I need. So over on this side, this is the stuff that I'm going to need for myself, right? So I've got my gown, I've got my M95, um, I've got my um, eye covers, and I've got my gloves. Over here is going to be all the stuff I need for my point of care ultrasound. And <clears throat> one of the principles I want all of you to think about is we want to minimize the amount of contact we, we have with the machine with a contaminated surface. So I'm going to include in the things I want to bring in, I'm going to have a probe cover. And then I'm also going to use something to cover my machine with, right? And so in this case, if it's a phone, I can actually just slip it into one of these biomassing bags. Right, and so this came from me just raiding the supply closet on the unit, find something that my phone could fit in easily. And again, this should minimize the amount of contact my phone has with the contaminated room. The next thing that I want you to think about when you're getting ready is you should have some sort of container that you can take your machine out of the room in that will not be contaminated, rather than taking a machine that's potentially contaminated out of the room and now you have to put it on a surface and contaminate a new surface. So again, um, the recommendation is some sort of bucket or container is probably the easiest. Um, our units usually have these big buckets. Uh, today they're all out of them, but, but this one will work just fine for a phone size. If you don't want to waste a bucket, you could actually just use a plastic bag. So this is again, this is on one of our units. We have a larger plastic bag. And again, on my way out, I can take all this with me. The other thing is we're going to want to have something to wipe our machine down with. And so um, if you know that you've got, you're sure you've got some sort of sanitizing wipe um, in the room, then it shouldn't be a big problem. But many of us, you don't know where that's going to be, where is it going to be in relationship to um, a safe place to sterilize your machine in the room. And so many of us will say, well, have your bucket, I mean, have your uh, wipes here. You can bring them right in with you, and then they're there for you when you need them. And so I'm going to go through how I do this. So let's go ahead and do our demonstration. Again, this is not rocket science, but it is helpful to walk through the steps. The so first thing I do, whenever I go into a COVID room, I'm gonna minimize the amount of stuff I bring in. So I, I take my vest off. Um, I don't wanna have high collars or anything that potentially could be exposed. I'm gonna put on my gown here. Every place is probably using slightly different PP, and it's gonna be what's available to you. This is what we have here. Uh, but, you know, the principles are all going to be the same. I'm going to make sure the gown completely covers the backside here. Ideally, if you have a second person with you, they can check to make sure that you don't have uh, a gap at the back of your gown. Next thing I'm going to do, this is a, an old N95 that uh, I was getting fitted with, so I'm not wasting N95s here just for demos. Um, but this one hasn't been contaminated. Let me do my quick fit test here. All right. I'm gonna put on my eye shield and in a different place you're using different uh, eye shields. This is what we've been using here. These are some recycled ones, so they're actually a little bit fuzzy. I'm gonna get on my gloves. And now I'm going to go ahead and get my machine ready. You don't have to gown up before you get your machine ready. This has just been my practice, okay? And so what I'll do is I actually, while I'm still outside the room, I'm going to go ahead and put my probe cover on. I find this is a little bit easier rather than once you're inside the room messing around with this. Now, I'm lucky that these probe covers have sterile gel with me. And this is actually really useful. If you're used to carrying around a big bottle of gel, now you've got one more thing to sterilize. And so what I highly recommend is 
bring this guy with you. And then I'm gonna go ahead and put my probe cover on now. Some of these are different lengths. These are pretty good um, here. They, they'll cover the, the length of the cord. If you happen to have a wireless machine, that's even nicer because, well, then you don't have to worry about covering the wire. Uh, but there's not that many wireless machines out of the market yet, but they are pretty good if you've got one. So I made sure I put gel on the inside. Now I'm just going to bring this guy down. This is a, all right, and I'm going to throw one of these on here. Now this is not a very long probe cover, so what I'm going to do, I'm go ahead and connect this to my phone, and now what I'm going to do is keep most of my wire inside my other bag, right? And so I'll take this. You have to be careful since this is just the biohazard bag that was available. You could obviously get other bags if you desire. But I'm going to go ahead and throw this in. And then I'm going to actually put all of my cord in here. So again, minimize any, any potential contamination. Now you could ask yourself, is it possible I could just wipe this whole thing down really well? Totally. But again, the principle being we want to really minimize any contamination uh, when we're using this equipment. So now I've got this all sealed up. Again, you're going to do your best job with any cord. It's probably going to be somewhat imperfect, but you want to do your best to minimize contamination. Okay. Now I'm going to take this, put it into my bucket here. I'm going to add my gel to make sure I have that. And then again, what I recommend doing is taking a couple wipes with you because you're not sure whether they're going to be there. Okay, I'm going to go into my room. When I get into the patient room, right, now I'm going to leave my wipes here in the bucket. I'm going to be at least six feet away from the patient. My bucket is going to be usually right near the door, right? That's, the, my goal is to not let that get contaminated, right? I'm going to take with me my, my ultrasound equipment and my gel. I'm going to go over, I'm going to ultrasound my patient. Now I need to come back and now I need to get out of the room. And this is the part where, again, most people, this is where you're going to more likely mess this up. Now my gel, I can just throw away. Don't need that anymore. Now I've got to make sure I can uh, clean this effectively. Again, there's not one way to do this, but we want to be as safe as possible. So right now I've got contaminated hands, okay? And I've got a contaminated equipment. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead first. I'm going to go, I'm going to go ahead and put on new gloves over my old gloves. Again, this is not the only way to do it, but we think this is probably the safest. So now I've got gloves on that at least should be partially contaminate free. And now I can wipe down. Now I'm going to go ahead and take this guy out and I'm going to wipe it all down. All right. So I'll take my ultrasound out. I'm going to take the probe out. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to use one of my one of my wipes here. I'm going to wipe down the probe. What, what I've found works for me is then I'll place the probe in here, and that way I can wipe the cord down really well, I'll speed the whole cord out. Okay, just in case it got contaminated somehow while I was in there with the patient, I'm going to wipe this down. Then I'm going to wipe my phone down. Okay, be really good about getting surfaces there. Then I'm going to place all this into my bucket again because this. We didn't bring near the patient, it should be cleaned. Now I'm gonna go through all the steps, right, of taking all of my, my uh, equipment off, right? So I'm not gonna bore you guys with that, you've all seen that done, all right? And then I just wanna show you the last thing you're gonna do. So I take all my equipment off, right? And I'm gonna go outside of the room, all right? So we'll just pretend now I'm outside of the room. Now, since we think this is clean, right, I can carry this outside the room, but we're still not totally sure about this. This was in the room. We want to be really careful. So when I get out of the room, I can take my N95 off. And many of you will have a place near, um, near your patient rooms, especially if you're on a COVID ward, where there is a place for sterilizing equipment. We do have those in our COVID ward. So I would take that over to that area. Okay. Again, this is the clean part inside is potentially contaminated. I'm going to set that down. I'm going to get on a new pair of gloves. And I'm going to go through the same process we did before, right? So again, pretty standard, no, not, nothing crazy here. I'm going to put on my new gloves, and I'm going to wipe down the equipment again. Again, so what are the, what are the hard parts? What are the important parts to remember? 
Make sure you get all your equipment that you're gonna need, including, again, some way to get the machine in and out of the contaminated room, somewhere where you can hold it, you're not gonna contaminate yourself, and then you're gonna be able to wipe down the surface, okay? It can be a bucket, can be a bag, either one works. Make sure you bring in gel that you can throw away when you're done with it, okay? Bring some wipes with you, and if you follow those rules, you'll be just fine. And I think that is the end of my time. I'm getting signals from my lovely wife that we need to, we need to finish up here. So next up, we have uh, Joshua. Thanks, John. It's, um, it's good to be with you during what continues to be a difficult time to talk about the important topic of caregiver well-being and sustainment. I'm going to talk briefly about the range of psychological and behavioral responses that occur after disasters and public health emergencies such as COVID-19. Um, Dr. Kuglu just talked about the importance of protecting ourselves from illness and infection. Um, there are also ways we can protect ourselves from the adverse mental health effects of exposure to a prolonged crisis. Um, there are steps, there are a lot of steps that individuals and organizations can take to enhance well-being and sustainment during this event. Um, I'm going to share a few interventions we can borrow from other professions that routinely work in high stress, high threat environments for prolonged periods of time. They can also be utilized to support personnel in a healthcare environment. Um, Great. Um, and these are, uh, that last slide, these are my thoughts and, and ideas, and um, I have no uh, disclosures to report. Um, much of what we know about the impact of trauma comes from our study of disasters, including those that are natural or climate related, um, as well as human generated. Pandemics are often considered natural disasters, but as we've seen with COVID-19, the conditions that create and propagate infectious disease outbreaks often have their origins in human systems and behaviors. Historically, the psychological and behavioral impacts of a disaster are experienced by more people over a greater geography across a much longer period of time than all other medical effects combined. But this is important for disaster resource planning. And if history is any predictor, we should expect a significant tail of mental health needs that extend for a considerable period of time after this event. Um, if you take a look at this diagram or this uh, figure here, um, psychiatric disorders make up an important portion of morbidity and mortality associated with disasters. But before disorders occur and with much greater frequency, um, the public as well as healthcare workers experience distress reactions and engage in health risk behaviors. Insomnia, decreased sense of safety, substance use and family conflict are all common. And these negatively impact social and occupational functioning and create significant public mental health burden. For instance, whether or not someone has alcohol use disorder, the increased use of alcohol is associated with a wide variety of adverse population health effects, such as medical errors, accidents, family conflict, um, and workplace presenteeism. And these are important issues for organizations, healthcare, and our society. When distress reactions and health risk behaviors show up in healthcare, it's typically in primary care and emergency settings. They also show up in other sectors of society, such as law enforcement and social services. This really underscores the importance of building and sustaining partnerships among healthcare specialties, as well as other professional disciplines to more effectively support public mental health during and after disasters. Um, a critical mental health intervention during COVID-19 We'll be reminding patients, ourselves, um, and our colleagues that distress and risk behaviors are normal and expectable reactions to disasters. Normalizing these often transient reactions is reassuring for most people and avoids over-medicalizing and pathologizing people's experiences. We can further enhance sustainment over time by encouraging healthy outlets for coping and ensuring people know when and where to get additional help if needed. It's also really important to remember and message to others that the vast majority of people, including those who experience difficulties during this pandemic will ultimately do well. Many will even experience an increased perception of their ability to manage future stressors. Right now, these are particularly important messages, both for ourselves, our patients and everyone. Next slide. Following exposure to disasters, we can reduce distress and improve functioning by enhancing a sense of safety, 
calming, self or community efficacy, social connectedness, and hope or optimism. These elements form the basis of what has been called psychological first aid. Um, that's an evidence-based framework for supporting resilience in individuals, communities, and organizations. It's also helpful to remember, of course, that in any intervention is going to be most effective when delivered within the unique cultural and contextual factors of a given community. There are multiple factors to consider for individuals and organizations that play a role in well-being and sustainment of the healthcare workforce. And as I mentioned, I'm going to highlight a few interventions that can be implemented at the individual and organizational level, which can enhance well-being and sustainment for caregivers and others during COVID-19. The first one that I'll talk about um, is buddy systems. Buddy systems are not new. Um, swim buddies check in and keep each other accountable. Uh, many high-risk occupations have buddies that check each other's work. The concept of buddies has been used in different communities to promote safety, efficacy, and social support, which as I mentioned are all protective during crisis events. The battle buddy system developed by the United States Army has buddies check in with each other daily provide encouragement, help with problem solving and reaching out when a buddy seems to be drifting away or isolating or just having a hard time. Buddies can also fill in information and correct distortions of thought that might occur during and after high stress situations. These distortions, such as thinking we failed to do something we should have or did something we should not, can lead to moral distress. Having a buddy help clarify the events that unfold more fully and accurately is one way of preventing moral distress from taking hold. The battle buddy system has been adopted in some healthcare settings to support the safety and well being of caregivers. In these systems, um, different from the Army, providers typically had a significant role in the selection of their buddy. Early response to the program has been very positive, and there are other healthcare systems developing similar organization driven peer support systems. This is a formal rather than ad hoc system of peer support and is particularly useful for a workforce in which personnel often have difficulty asking for help. Instead, the giving and receiving of help and support is essentially baked in to how the organization functions and becomes part of daily operations. And we don't need to wait for an organization to develop a buddy system. We can find someone who's willing to commit to exchanging support and encouragement and create a buddy system on our own. Sometimes when a few people start something, it catches on. Other people see that it's helpful to you and want to be part of something. Um, and if you are in any kind of leadership position, such as a team leader or service chief or other, um, you can start a buddy system with your, within your own team members. It's important to remember that we can exert influence and control in some areas of our work, such as creating our own system of formal peer support. This is particularly helpful to remember when so many other things might be feeling out of control right now. And a final comment on the issue of buddy systems and language. In different cultures and contexts, people are likely to have different feelings and experiences about words like battle. So whether you call it a battle buddy or something else, um, having someone with whom caregivers commit to maintaining a regular ongoing connection and mutual support can be an invaluable aspect of sustainment during a crisis event. Next slide. Most disasters have a cycle. So we talk about preparing, responding, and then recovering. In COVID-19, the ongoing and protracted nature of this event means we have to rethink our ideas about recovery in particular. Recovery often implies restoration of systems and a return to baseline functioning for individuals. In COVID-19, it may be more appropriate to think about resetting. Resetting is getting ourselves to a state of once again being ready to manage the range of challenges that are happening at home and work. The ability to reset will be critical to sustaining um, operations and ourselves during this prolonged crisis event. People are going to reset in different ways. For some people, that will be a vacation. Many people will benefit from some time away from work. Even if that just means taking a break from working into the night or weekend, as has become the new normal for some people during this pandemic. Individuals that find a way to reset will feel more able to sustain their functioning at home and work over the long haul. And organizations that ensure personnel are both given the opportunity and encouraged to take time to reset, recharge, and connect with loved ones are likely to have a more positive and productive workforce. As the pandemic curve 
um, comes down in different areas. It'll be important to anticipate and plan for reintegration challenges. These are the difficulties that can emerge after individuals experience prolonged periods of extreme stress, exposure to distressing events, and even perhaps separation from family as well as their primary work teams. The study of other professions that share some of these exposures has taught us that the process of reintegrating into work and home and society can be challenging. Some people will experience decreased sense of meaning in more routine work. Some people will feel isolated because others don't understand their experiences. Perspectives can change and the usual daily problems of life might start to seem trivial, maybe even irritating when compared to the pain and suffering somebody witnessed over days, weeks, or months. Individuals might experience conflict over how to come back together as a family. Some people will miss and long for the rush of adrenaline from a high stress, high threat environment. So all of these things can create challenges for people as they try to reconnect with a more routine way of life at home and work. In fact, for some people, um, they will actually experience more distress around this aspect of the disaster than when they were working on the front lines of COVID-19. It's good for individuals and families, as well as organizations to plan for reintegration challenges for both healthcare workers and their families. When individuals, families, um, and others are educated about the possibility of re reintegration challenges, how they can manifest and what steps to take um, in order to respond to those. This can also help um, reduce distress, enhance functioning, and improve our ability to ultimately recover. Next slide. Thank you. Um, now I'll turn it over to Janaid. Thank you, Joshua, for that talk. Uh, we're going to switch gears slightly now. My name is Janaid Zaman. I'm a cardiology, uh, cardiology consultant and a lecturer physiologist from the Royal Brompton Hospital in London. Um, and it's my uh, delight to at least uh, give you a whistle stop run through on the impact of COVID 19 on cardiology practice and certainly a specific view from the Royal Brompton Hereford, which was. Um, the one of the first hospitals in the UK to go a fully 100% COVID-19 uh, and is actually still um, under government control to be a COVID centre only. It, in its normal day life, it is a, uh, the largest heart and lung centre in the UK. And so we've got some unique perspectives to share from that. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm gonna have a information dense talk. I'm gonna uh, whistle through a bit of context, the pathophysiology of COVID-19, how it affects the heart in terms of mechanisms, talk about patient risk factors, briefly summarize guidelines, and then focus a little bit on the diagnosis and biomarker data, which are emergently um, showing high-risk groups, and then the specific disease manifestations in the cardiovascular um, uh, syndrome before a few slides on treatment considerations specific mention of QTC monitoring, and then conclude with some risk stratification slides. So let's start. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So severe uh, acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2 or SARS-CoV-2, uh, as you're all aware, has reached pandemic levels causing coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19. Patients with cardiovascular risk factors and established cardiovascular disease represent a vulnerable population when suffering from COVID-19 and patients with cardiac injury in this context of COVID-19 have an increased risk of morbidity and mortality. To make matters worse, cardiovascular comorbidities are common in patients with COVID-19 infection and cardiovascular disease risk factors and disease correlate with increasing age, which we all know is one of the major uh, risk factors for an adverse uh, outcome and death from COVID-19. Next slide. In terms of pathophysiology, SARS-CoV-2 is an envelope positive sent single-stranded RNA virus. What does this mean? It means that it, along with the other coronavirus family uh, viruses, use the ACE2 protein for ligand binding before entering the uh, cell. The ACE2 is expressed in the heart, lung, and blood vessels. And if you remember, your uh, physiology is a member of the renin-angiotensin system, which is important in the general pathophysiology of lots and lots of cardiovascular diseases. 
It is also highly expressed in type two lung cells, which provides a explanation for the predominantly respiratory symptoms experienced by patients with COVID-19. However, sequence studies have shown that 7.5 or uh, more than this percent of myocardial cells also have this receptor on board, which could allow direct viral entry into cardiomyocytes and cause a direct cardiotoxic effect, uh, which I'll go on to describe on the next slide. Next slide, please. So the mechanisms of how the uh, cardiovascular system is injured are not fully clear and are likely multifactorial. The cardiovascular disease associated with COVID-19 COVID likely involves the dysregulation of this system, the renal angiotensin one, and patient comorbidities. Whereas the cardiovascular disease may be a primary phenomenon, it may also be secondary to acute lung injury, which leads to increasing cardiac workload, which is clearly problematic in patients who have pre-existing heart failure. And there's an increasingly recognized phenomenon called cytokine release store, which originates from the imbalance of T cell activation with dysregulated release of interleukins, which may contribute to the cardiovascular manifestation of COVID-19. Finally, immune system activation per se, along with alterations in immune metabolism, may result in plaque instability, contributing to the development of acute coronary events. Next slide. This slide just summarizes this in pictorial fashion. It's from an excellent review in Heart that came out a, about a month ago and uh, shows how the SARS-CoV-2 virus causes a, uh, either a direct cardiotoxic effect, a hypoxemia-mediated effect, a supply-demand mismatch effect, a cytokine storm effect, or a effect such as disseminated intravascular coagulation, or DIC, and that can lead to the cardiac manifestations on the right, such as acute coronary syndrome, arrhythmia, which is my particular specialty, myocarditis, venous thrombolism, or heart failure and cardiogenic shock. Next slide. In terms of risk factors, uh, this is a, a summary slide from a, uh, another excellent review in Jack uh, last month, which shows that patients who have got prior cardiovascular disease who have some form of immune activation present with shock, present with metabolic disarray or coagulopathy or immobility are at higher risk of developing the cardiovascular complications we've mentioned on a previous slide. And next slide, please. I wanted to uh, have one slide about hypertension because this has been covered quite a lot in the press. There is actually no evidence currently to suggest that hypertension per se is an independent risk factor for severe complications or death from COVID-19 infection. The initial studies that reported this were not controlled for age and confounding comorbidities. And despite much speculation, evidence from a lot of recently published observational cohort studies at the time of review of this slide deck suggests that prior or current treatment with ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers does not increase the risk of COVID-19 infection or the risk of developing severe complications of COVID-19 when compared to the risk in patients taking other hypertensive drugs from other classes. So the take-home message is treatment of hypertension should follow existing recommendations in the guidelines and no change to these recommendations is necessary during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide. This uh, figure from the same Jack review summarizes, in fact, the major consensus guidelines from around the world with the ACC, the European Society of Cardiology, the European Society of Hypertension, Hypertension Canada, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society, and the International Society of Hypertension, all endorsing essentially the same viewpoint, which is a specific protocols need to be developed for COVID-19 risk stratification, but essentially there is insufficient evidence for the routine cessation of this important group of medications in patients at the moment. Next slide. So how do patients present and how does one make the diagnosis? Well, it's obviously confused by the fact that chest pain and breath assess is a frequent symptom in COVID-19 infection. Chronic and acute coronary syndrome presentations can clearly overlap and be associated with respiratory symptoms. And as we have all seen, COVID-19 patients can present with the triad of cough, shortness of breath, and fulminant lung injury, such as acute respiratory distress syndrome. In COVID-19 patients with impaired end organ perfusion who are at risk of cardiogenic shock, such as from a large heart attack, you should also consider sepsis as a possible or mixed etiology. And finally, myocarditis or direct myocardial injury should be considered as a precipitating cause of a patient who presents with cardiogenic shock if that's the kind of center where you're seeing patients. Next slide. In terms of biomarkers, cardiomyocyte injury, either quantified by cardiac troponins, or uh, BNPs or NTBNPs may occur in COVID-19 infections as in all other pneumonias. The level of these biomarkers correlate with disease severity and mortality 
and hence both these biomarkers should be interpreted as quantitative variables. The slide at the bottom summarizes a, a nice figure from the ESC COVID-19 guidance, which shows that one can have COVID-19 in a mild form with uh, elevations of cardiac troponin up to the ULN or the upper limit of normal. Above this, with severe COVID-19, a mild uh, troponinemia in the kind of 80s to 100 might be expected. And with fulminant myocarditis, Takotsuba or cardiogenic shock, a troponin rise in the hundreds would be expected. Next slide. Data uh, I'd like to share from the Royal Brompton Hospital, shared by an ICU consultant uh, called Dr. Ben Garfield, shows actually this is a very robust relationship. Looking at 209 admissions that we've had over the last few months, censored as of a few weeks ago, if one segregates the patients into those who survived alive and those who didn't, all of the biomarkers on the left notably included maximum BNP, maximum troponin, and uh, maximum LDH and D-dimer, all are statistically significantly uh, lower in patients who uh, survived discharge than those who died in the intensive care unit. Um, this is from a, um, an extended series we're currently in the process of writing up, but shows that these parameters are early risk stratification uh, for patients in whom cardiovascular manifestations are suspected, as in specialist centers like ours. Next slide, please. This is a busy slide, which I do want you to go through, but essentially uh, just summarizes the four different categories of COVID-19 associated cardiovascular disease, and uh, essentially is more specialist knowledge for assessment and triage for a general cardiologist. It was published in circulation uh, just a few months ago, and it describes the management of ST segment elevation, cardiogenic shock, decompensated heart failure, and the very specialist group of uh, heart transplant recipient patients who will likely already be under uh, their own cardiologist. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions about this further towards uh, in the chat, but um, again, because this is very specialist innovation, typically for cardiologists, I'll move on to my next slide. In terms of general treatment considerations, this is a, another slide from the um, heart review showing that the treatment considerations that are likely to impact all patients with a cardiovascular manifestation of COVID are if one presents for with an acute coronary syndrome, such as an ST elevation, myocardial infarction, or NSTEMI, the, con the consideration of whether a primary PCI pathway is uh, safe for providers and patients, or whether a medical therapy, such as thrombolytics, is preferred is, is very important. Uh, we talked about myocardial injury and the uh, worst prognosis with monitoring uh, biomarkers. As these patients are all hypercoagulable, they all need thromboprophylaxis. Uh, we've already covered the ACE inhibitor ARB use, which should be continued until further uh, guidance is um, uh, released or studies are pending. And then in terms of specific treatments, uh, the mechanical circulatory support, or MCS, is why patients come to centers like ours at the Brompton for ECMO. And I'm going to talk about the other two uh, in more detail on the next slide, please. So QTC monitoring is very important. This is something which uh, has attracted some attention due to a case reports of patients who have had cardiac arrest after starting hydroxychloroquine. You can, can see on the left-hand side of the flow diagram that no ECG is required in patients who have low risk profile. This is patients with a QTC of less than 500 milliseconds, no history of structural heart disease, arrhythmia or syncope, no history of acquired or congenital long QT syndrome, and no bradycardia. One should correct all the modifiable QTC prolonging factors as shown in the box on the top right. And then if the COVID-19 medication is started and the ECG after day one shows no change, either with a QTC of still less than 500 milliseconds or a delta QTC of less than 60 milliseconds, no further ECG is required. If, however, this is not the case, they need to be evaluated by cardiology, have daily ECGs or be admitted, admitted to telemetry. Next slide, please. In terms of drug-drug interactions, in addition to the hydroxychloroquine and ECG manifestations, steroids such as methylprednisolone and dexamethasone, which has recently been shown to be uh, a, um, to confer improved survival in patients who are ventilated, can impact with anticoagulants. And antiretroviral drugs, of which are many on the market and currently undergoing trials, can impact all kinds of uh, cardiovascular drugs, as you can see in the table below. Next slide, please. This is a summary slide just showing how to essentially approach the patient who is known to have either prior cardiovascular disease or no prior cardiovascular disease and who is COVID-19 negative or COVID-19 positive, focusing on the uh, COVID-19 negative patients with prior cardiovascular disease, as many of you will see, uh, telemedicine and e-visits are very important and are topics we've covered before in this webinar series. 
And then prioritizing high risk systems and procedures is important using some of the clues I've hopefully shared with you during this talk. So next slide, please. So this is my conclusion slide. Patients with pre-existing cardiovascular disease appear to have worse outcomes with COVID-19. Cardiovascular complications include biomarker elevations, myocarditis, heart failure, and venous thromboembolism, which may be exacerbated by delays in care. And therapies under investigation for COVID-19 may have significant drug-drug interactions with cardiovascular medications. And finally, of utmost importance, healthcare workers and health systems should take measures to ensure safety whilst providing high-quality care for COVID-19 patients. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, these are just some pictures to share from uh, the Royal Brompton Hospital in London and the nice tattoo on the pavement outside thanking the NHS for its heroic efforts in the UK. With that, I'd like to hand over to our next speaker, Fernanda. Uh, thank you, Junaid. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Fernanda Rossi. I am a postdoctoral research fellow at the Department of Veterans Affairs Palo Healthcare System and at Stanford University School of Medicine. Uh, I'm a clinical psychologist by training, and I'll be talking today about intimate partner violence screening and support for women veterans during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to mention a few things. The first thing is that my talk will focus on women, but this is not to say that men and other populations do not experience intimate partner violence. But much of what I will talk about, uh, I think, can be applied to other populations. But I'll be focusing on women because much of the work on intimate partner violence in the VA thus far has focused on women. The second thing I'd like to mention is that I'll be focusing on the VA healthcare system. But again, much of what I say, I think, can be applied or adapted to other healthcare systems. So I hope that the information that I provide today about VA can serve as an example of what one healthcare system is doing to address uh, challenges with intimate partner violence screening and support during this time. Next slide, please. So intimate partner violence or IPV, which can be defined as physical or sexual violence, stalking, psychological aggression or coercion by a former or current intimate partner is a very common experience among women veterans. There are studies that suggest that up to 60% of women veterans in relationships report experiencing IPV. There are also studies that suggest that women veterans are at higher risk for experiencing IPV compared to civilian women. So because of this, even before the pandemic, uh, the VA has put much effort into establishing routine IPV screening and support in VA facilities nationwide. But as with other populations and other healthcare systems, the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in many disruptions and changes to veteran healthcare. And unfortunately, these changes have impacted the way VA providers screen for IPV and provide support, creating many new challenges for them. So for example, uh, prior to the pandemic, much of uh, IPV screening in the VA was conducted in person at uh, primary care clinics and uh, specialty care clinics. However, given stay at home orders and social distancing recommendations coming from the pandemic, many non-essential healthcare visits were either canceled or uh, completed using telehealth. But without appropriate provider practices and cautions, IPV screening via telehealth may actually put women veterans at even greater risk of danger because in telehealth, it makes it very difficult for the provider to know who is in the room or who might be overhearing the conversation you know, if an abusive partner overhears or an ex unexpectedly walks into the room, he might get angry and use um, additional abusive and violent behavior. Or uh, perhaps an abusive partner may uh, try to record the conversation between the patient and her healthcare provider. Um, also, controlling partners may prevent women from finding isolated locations in which to speak privately and any attempts to seek privacy 
may be met with suspicion and aggression. So overall, uh, women veterans experiencing IPV may have considerable difficulties uh, finding safe and private locations to speak with a healthcare provider during the pandemic, and privacy is a necessary prerequisite for safely conducting IPV screening. The other challenge uh, is provider ability to provide support to women uh, experiencing IPV. Because of shelter in place and social dis distancing recommendations, many resources that were available prior to the pandemic are now limited or unavailable. Uh, for example, many domestic violence shelters have closed, uh, many courthouses and other public agencies are limiting their services. Even utilizing domestic violence hotlines may be difficult for women experiencing IPV if they're unable to find a private location at which to make calls or send text messages. Uh, the other thing are safety plans that were previously developed uh, before the pandemic. They may no longer be applicable if friends, family, or shelters are no longer an escape option. Uh, also, out of fear of getting COVID, um, some women may be reluctant to access medical care like going to an emergency department due to an IPV-related injury. So all of these challenges, unfortunately, come at a time when women veterans may be in most need of help. Uh, there are initial reports indicating increases in rates of IPV worldwide. These increases are likely due to having to shelter in place with an abusive partner and having no escape coupled with the increased emotional, financial, occupational, and social stressors resulting from the pandemic. And the uh, effects of the pandemic uh, on IPV will likely be long lasting. So for example, even with the lifting of shelter in place orders, unemployment might keep partners at home, further entrapping women in abusive situations. Next slide, please. But the VA is working to address uh, challenges with IPV screening and support. Efforts to address these challenges are being led by the National VA Intimate Partner Violence Assistance Program. Uh, this program was developed specifically um, to help veterans, their families, and employees at the VA impacted by IPV. Uh, the Intimate Partner Violence Assistance Program has implemented various strategies during the pandemic to help with IPV screening and support. So in terms of IPV screening, they, uh, for example, have revised their protocol so that providers know how to do an environmental safety check during a telehealth visit. Um, so, for example, as part of that protocol, before starting the visit, providers should make sure that a partner or other individuals are not around. Um, they can ask simple yes or no questions, which through video requires that the patient only nod her head yes or no. Um, it's also uh, helpful, if possible, if the patient can wear headphones. That way, the, the provider can ask yes or no questions and all the patient has to do is nod her head. And also, um, if, uh, for example, the partner unexpectedly walks into the room, uh, the provider uh, should wait quietly. In terms of providing IPV support, um, the Intimate Partner Violence Assistant Program has employed a multi-method approach targeting both veterans and staff. For example, they have focused on raising awareness and providing education by posting information on social media. They have uh, sent out internal emails. They have also developed fact sheets for staff and veterans. And all of these materials include updated contact information and updated resources um, that can be helpful to those um, experiencing intimate partner violence, as well as providers who are helping with this issue. Um, another thing is that there are IPV coordinators at VA facilities 
nationally who have worked to update their local resource and referral lists. And these IPV coordinators have been continuously disseminating this information to staff. Um, and also, the uh, Intimate Partner Violence Program has worked to transition IPV-related services to telehealth. Uh, for example, women can have telehealth interactions with an IPV coordinator. Um, also, uh, the, the VA is offering a, the Strength at Home program now through telehealth, and the Strength at Home program is an evidence-based program designed to help reduce the use of violence against an intimate partner. Next slide, please. So despite these efforts by the VA, uh, additional solutions are needed to address challenges with IPV screening and support during the COVID-19 pandemic. I've listed some ideas here. Uh, so for example, one idea is perhaps to establish a VA secure messaging uh, because this will allow women to access IPV information and resources at a time when it is safe for them to do so away from an abusive partner. Another idea is to place informational brochures at essential businesses like grocery stores to help better disseminate information. Um, I also think it'll be important to partner with media outlets also to, to help disseminate um, resources and information. And finally, um, I think it'll be important to continue partnerships with internal VA programs and with external programs um, like shelters and advocacy groups. I think uh, partnerships will go a long way in helping provide resources to women. So these are just um, some ideas, but I think it's important to keep uh, brainstorming solutions because the pandemic is evolving and these are very difficult times for women experiencing IPV and we, we must work to protect their safety. Next slide, please. So I just like quickly like to acknowledge my collaborators here. Um, they have helped me think through this topic and together we wrote a piece on this uh, issue that just came out at, in the Journal of General Internal Medicine, um, just hot off the press. And I'm happy to send this, this article to you. My contact information is here, but um, you will also be able to find it if you search it. Thank you, and I'll be turning it over to my colleague, Dr. Mega Shankar. COVID-19, a pandemic that forced us all to look at mortality in the face. A disease that makes us question, do we focus on prolonging life or providing comfort? How do we tell family they cannot visit their dying loved one? How do we respond to an emergency without exposing ourselves to the virus. COVID-19, a force that demanded us to reflect on what it means to first do no harm. How do we do no harm at the end of life brought on by a relentless virus? Perhaps we shift from cure to care from intervening to listening. Listening to our patients' stories, wisdom, and legacy. We might learn that our patient is a published poet, or that she plays in a hometown band. He might reveal he is a revered Hindu priest, or that she is a proud veteran hero. We have the obligation and privilege to witness their life as we prepare them for death. Witnessing is, as poet David White said, the privilege of having been seen by someone 
and the equal privilege of being granted the sight of the essence of another, to have walked with them and to have believed in them, and sometimes just to have accompanied them for however brief a span on a journey impossible to accomplish alone. Witnessing is perhaps the most sacred role of a physician at the bedside. During COVID-19, while we do our best to treat patients to cure, let us also not forget to listen to their stories, validate their lives, and reignite our human connection, bringing what's hidden here. Thank you so much. And I just wanted to note that this is a reflection on end of life care during the times of COVID-19 based off of a um, piece that I had written for an online magazine called In-House. And I will now pass it over to Sonu to wrap up. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mega, and thank you everybody for your presentations today. Um, I hope the participants had an opportunity to learn from the wide range of subjects we chose to cover from the clinical side, from a systemic organizational perspective, and also from the human perspective, because in the end, the people suffering from COVID-19 are humans, their family, their friends, their paid and unpaid caregivers are humans and all the clinical team that help take care of these patients are all human. So thank you all. Uh, we will have our next webinar on August 4th. Uh, prior to that, you will get um, information from Stanford CME asking you to submit whatever you need to submit in order to get the CME credit. Uh, we'll also be sending you a feedback form. And uh, Finally, you'll also get the registration link for the August 4th webinar. Between now and then, if you have ideas and suggestions of subjects you'd like us to cover, please contact us through the Stanford, um, through the Society of Bedside Medicine website. Um, and we thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you next month. Bye-bye.